Hello and welcome everybody to ICMDA webinars. I'm Dr. Peter Saunders, the Chief Executive of the International Christian Medical and Dental Association, which brings together around 60,000 Christian doctors and dentists from all over the world. And today we're honored to have back Dr. Trevor Stammers, who's going to be addressing the subject of organs from the dead, intriguing title. So it's a, it's a great pleasure to welcome back uh, one of our regular speakers, Dr. Trevor Stammers, uh, to talk to us on the subject of organs from the dead. And rates for deceased donations greatly vary across the world, but organ transplantation heavily depends upon them and virtually exclusively so for vital organs such as the heart. But this raises many ethical questions about the nature of death. Could the dead be harmed? Who should give consent for donation when the, the wishes of the deceased are unclear or haven't been stated? Should the dead donor rule be abandoned as some are suggesting? And these are the, and other questions will be explored from a Christian perspective. Dr. Trevor Stammers uh, is based in the UK. He was editor of the New Bioethics Journal until very recently. He was formerly also Associate Professor of Bioethics and Law at St. Mary's University in London and was a family doctor before that for 27 years before going into academia. His latest book, The Ethics of Glo Global Organ Acquisition, will be published later this year. Trevor, it's a real pleasure to have you back again uh, on another intriguing, uh, difficult and complicated uh, subject in bioethics and we really look forward to hearing what you have to say and to the discussion afterwards uh, thank you thank you very much peter it may not be quite so complicated as my trying to get uh, to share the screen but let's uh, see if we can get that mastered first of all that's looking good and yes we are away that's uh, uh, that's excellent it's good um well great to be with you this is quite a uh, technical uh, subject, uh, but I have tried to uh, make it as uh, clear as I possibly uh, can. And this is where we'll be going. Uh, we'll be looking at why deceased donation is important, um, a bit about consent, determining death, how death and organ donation relate, and then uh, a little bit at the end about uh, donations from uh, the nearly dead. So why is do deceased uh, donation important? Well, uh, this is the latest data from the United Kingdom. And uh, you can see there that uh, up until the pandemic uh, hit in 2019-20, uh, our waiting list, which is the top thin line, uh, was uh, coming down uh, slowly but regularly every year and then of course when the uh, pandemic uh, hit uh, living donation was particularly um, affected and um, so although the numbers on the transplant list came down the numbers of transplants also went down so these people left the list um, by death and uh, died on it and uh, most countries in the world had a reduction in transplants of around um, uh, up to a third. So uh, big problems still in uh, catching up now. Uh, and you can see from this <clears throat> uh, busier slide, um, if you look towards 2020, uh, uh, 21, how badly affected each category of donation was and the the right-hand paler column in each trio uh, is the living donors. So from 2019-20 uh, with 1,058 living donors, you'll see that there were less than half of living donors the following year. Um, but deceased uh, donations also fell, um, but they fell by a smaller amount. And the pandemic aside, you can see that although living donations is the largest category of all, if you add up the two 
types of deceased donations, which are from uh, brain dead uh, deceased in the deeper blue and the lighter blue from those who had circulatory deaths. But if you add those two together, um, the deceased donations constitute more than uh, the living. So deceased donations really, really um, important. And in the UK, deceased donations contribute about 20%, uh, sorry, 60% uh, of the total donors in uh, 2019. And globally, that same year, about 63% of kidney transplants and 80% of liver transplants were from uh, deceased donors. And deceased donation is viewed by many people as a, uh, as a test of minimal morality. Those who take this view say that because the cost to the deceased is zero, um, that we really all ought to be prepared to do it because we cannot suffer after we die. And since the, op the other options are for the organs to be buried or burned, we have to have a very good moral reason um, in order for a choice not to donate uh, to be moral. Well, our earthly bodies are, of course, indeed, uh, are unable to suffer after we die. Although Jesus warns us to actually fear the one who can destroy soul and body in hell after death. But even uh, our earthly bodies can be wronged after death, I suggest, uh, in a variety of ways. And bodies can be violated in ways which both wrong the dead and harm those who love us. Uh, in Britain, the older Hay scandal in Liverpool, where children's organs were removed post-mortem without their parents' knowledge, is a good example of this. Those parents were very distressed to find out that that had happened to their children without their knowledge. So it's generally accepted that the expressed wishes of the dead prior to death should be respected and honored where possible. And Joseph's wish that his remains should be taken from Egypt back to the promised land is a biblical example of that. But if the wishes of the deceased are unknown, consent is usually sought from the family as well. But some ethicists, and notably David Shaw uh, from Zurich, have uh, repeatedly argued that family veto should be overridden on the utilitarian grounds that saving lives is far more important than respecting families' feelings. So this now brings me to uh, uh, a little bit about uh, consent. And uh, these are, uh, broadly speaking, the consent uh, mechanisms for deceased donation. Um, up until relatively recently, we had an opt-in system in the uh, UK where uh, a person has to uh, express a wish by signing on the donor register that they are willing for their organs to be taken after their, their death. Um, some countries, particularly a few uh, of the states in the US uh, and other countries, have uh, had mandated choice, which um, means that when you apply for a driving license or um, various other uh, state provided things, you have to make a choice of whether you are going to donate or not. Uh, they don't mandate the choice you have to make, but you do have to make one. Um, uh, but uh, the UK has just recently gone for a, a, an opt out and um, uh, many countries have, uh, have done this. We'll look at a couple in, in a moment. Um, and in an opt out, it is assumed that your organs uh, will, uh, you're willing to donate them unless you indicate to the contrary. And in a hard opt out, um, which certainly Singapore had uh, at, uh, at one uh, point, no family veto was allowed. And that eventually became upset when uh, uh, we had a debacle with security guards uh, having, uh, coming to remove relatives from uh, the body of their uh, 
deceased uh, dad uh, begging the hospital not to take his organs out. So a, a hard opt-out can lead to difficulties. With a soft opt-out, the family have um, the final say, and uh, that avoids the kind of problems that arose uh, in Singapore, and they've changed the system, I think, since uh, that time. But um, opt uh, opt uh, outs are um, largely uh, always thought to uh, increase the numbers of organs um, available, and Spain is usually the uh, example uh, given of that. Uh, but the guy who up until recently who's pictured here, who was in charge of uh, Spanish um, uh, transplant for about 30 years or more, he'd been there forever, said that actually it wasn't the change of the law that was likely to have led to Spain being a world leader um, because the families are always approached and always uh, have the last decision. And Spain has a very good um, mechanism of um, making sure that all possible cases relatives are approached and so on. And the underlying infrastructure medically is very, very good. And the one point I want to make about opt-outs is that they are by no means a guarantee in themselves that deceased donations will increase because the very same year that Spain uh, changed to an opt-out in 1979, Sweden did the same. And if it were an automatic solution, um, you need to explain why Sweden still has one of the lowest organ donation rates. And uh, it was about 19 uh, per million population in uh, 2019. And Spain, it's, it's currently uh, about 34, 35. They're, they're way in advance of uh, any other European country. So, and um, of course, in order to uh, uh, use any of the systems of, of consent, um, you have to uh, be sure that uh, the person is, is dead. And uh, classically, over history, these are some of the um, uh, criteria for uh, uh, determining that. And if the body is uh, putrefying, then there's usually no argument. Uh, if the body is cold, you've got to make sure they haven't died uh, from exposure, because sometimes uh, when bodies become cold um, and people are thawed out, they are found to be uh, uh, alive. But cessation of breathing, heartbeat, brain activity, uh, those have become uh, the uh, modern uh, sort of uh, uh, criteria, which we'll look at in a moment. Uh, but throughout history, uh, people have been rightly afraid of being buried or uh, otherwise disposed of whilst alive. And uh, the left-hand picture is uh, one of a charnel house, which uh, uh, was used for the storage of bones, but the rich often, uh, if they had a charnel house, um, wanted to be laid there for a certain amount of time before being buried. And on the right hand, uh, there is a photograph from 1921 of some vaults with a handle on the inside that people could choose to be placed in after their death for a while. Uh, to make sure they were dead before uh, they were uh, buried. And of course, these days, the reason that uh, this talk um, is being given is because since the development of ventilators and um, defibrillators, ceasing of breathing and cessation of uh, heartbeat have not necessarily uh, indicated that, uh, that, that people are uh, actually dead. And the nature of death is a theological issue more than a philosophical, uh, uh, a physiological one. And for the translators, I'm now back onto the text again. Uh, but the determination of death is of course medical. And um, one of the characteristics of death that the Bible and bioethics agree upon is its irreversible nature. People are destined to die once and after that face judgment, says Hebrews 9.27. So marking an irreversible episode is a necessary, 
but certain, uh, certainly not sufficient condition for an acceptable uh, definition of death. And if we mark the wrong episode, such as for uh, example, uh, a comatose state, then we run the risk of declaring someone dead when other markers would indicate that they are not. The US criteria for the determination of death is irreversible cessation of circulatory and respiratory functions, the determination of which must be made in accordance with medical standards. But of course, just as Jesus raised three people from the dead by his unique resurrection power, today we also have to make a distinction between spontaneous irreversibility of heartbeat, that is to say with no medical intervention, and total irreversibility even with defibrillation and other resuscitation measures. Now, one criteria for confirming circulatory uh, death in the UK Medical Royal College's code is that, quote, the individual should be observed by the person responsible for a minimum of five minutes to establish that irreversible cardiorespiratory arrest has occurred. And then the US auto resuscitation is considered not to occur after two minutes absence of uh, heartbeat. Now, the um, concern about the determination of death, I think, has um, arisen because there were some very early indicators when transplantation became possible that some people were actually more concerned about the importance of obtaining the organs than they were to necessarily establish uh, whether uh, the person was dead or not. And there are a couple of um, uh, examples uh, there uh, that you see on the screen. Now, most circulatory deaths are going to be from controlled um, uh, circulatory death. Most donations uh, will be from uh, controlled ones where the organs are recovered following an anticipated cardiac arrest after withdrawal of treatment. But there are, however, calls to increase the number of organ donations from uncontrolled uh, circulatory deaths. Where, and then this type, the patient has a, uh, a witnessed but unexpected arrest with no return to spontaneous activity in spite of resuscitation. And in those kind of deaths, after a declaration of death has occurred, organ perfusion can still be maintained by a variety of means, um, such as normothermic regional perfusion or circulating oxygenated blood with extracorporeal membranous oxygenation. But of course, these procedures are uh, invasive and may involve uh, aortic cannulation and, uh, and so on. And in 2008, uh, uh, Buczek and his colleagues reported a series of three successful heart transplants into infants using hearts from donors who'd only been declared dead 75 seconds after uh, cardiac function had ceased and the ethics committee of their hospital um, uh, permitted that to be done. Now, with brain death, this was um, proposed in 1968 by a Harvard Medical School uh, a committee in which they concluded that both irreversible coma and a permanent loss of inte intellect were criteria for death. Now, coma, of course, is an interesting term when it's applied to a, a, the state of a corpse. And it's clear that the authors of that report considered that though brain dead patients were biologically alive, their permanent unconsciousness justified legally defining them as dead. And the chair of the committee explained subsequently that he considered that where to draw the line in the process of death was arbitrary and that saving lives by transplantation was a good enough reason for drawing it at brain death. And in 1976, in the UK, the 
Royal Colleges generally agreed that brain death could be accepted as being sufficient to distinguish between patients who had a chance of partial recovery and those who would not. But that statement, however, reframed brain death as a prognosis, a prediction as to what will happen rather than a definition of death having occurred. So this necessitated a shift of emphasis in 1979 to a diagnosis that considered the brain dead patient to be actually dead since, quotes, all functions of the brain had permanently and irreversibly ceased. But not all activity in the brain had necessarily ceased. And in 1986, it was demonstrated that residual activity in some parts of the brain other than the brain stem was occurring in brain dead patients. Now, this activity was generally regarded um, uh, as irrelevant if the brain stem was not functioning. And in a very influential series of articles in the British Medical Journal on brain death, Pallas argued that in the same way that irreversible ceasing of heartbeat and respiration implied the death of the whole patient without implying the immediate death of every cell in the body, in likewise manner, the irreversible cessation of function of the brain stem does not immediately imply the death of every brain cell, though it does imply the death of the brain. The concept of loss of integrative functioning of the brain was then put forward as a sufficient reason to presume death. But as others soon pointed out when that idea came along, ventilating a corpse has a very different effect from ventilating someone diagnosed as brain dead. And the United States President's Council Report of 2008 finally admitted that brain dead patients do not fulfill the criteria of cessation of integrated function for the diagnosis of biological death and suggested abandoning that concept. They then suggested that there is good reason to believe that an injury has irreversibly destroyed a person's uh, ability to, uh, if there is good reason to believe an injury has irreversibly destroyed an organism's ability to perform its fundamental vital work, then the conclusion that that organism has died is warranted. So we've now moved to a different criteria, this concept of vital work. And that was defined as, quote, the work of self-preservation achieved through the organism's need-driven commerce with the surrounding world. Now, if- Trevor, need uh, is... Trevor sorry to interrupt. Um, your slides don't seem to be advancing. We've still got early yep. indicators of ethical conflict. Is that- That's, be that's because, right? Peter, I haven't, I haven't put any blank slides between that and the, de the dead donor rule, but thanks for checking. Uh, uh, no problem, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, we're, we're, we're about to change, in fact, yep. So, so the concept of vital work was described as the work of self-preservation achieved through the organism's need-driven commerce with the surrounding world. Now, if that is the bar, uh, then I suggest that that has been set uh, far too high, because on those criteria, every recluse is presumably dead, and perhaps even retired people like me. So not surprisingly, defining death as the inability to perform vital work uh, seems to have died uh, a, a death of its own. And I now should move a slide on as we come to the uh, dead donor rule, the penultimate topic. So the reason that these uncertainties about brain death and some elements of circulatory death is so concerning for organ donation is because of concern about violating the dead donor rule. 
Now, this rule was originally formulated in two different ways by John Robertson in the, um, around about the 80s, early 90s. And these are vital organs may only be removed from dead patients. And that's the death requirement formulation. And donors may not be killed in order to obtain that organs, which is the don't kill formulation. Now, as recently as 2009, Japan didn't permit organ donation after a diagnosis of brain death, unless the deceased had given written consent and also the relatives agreed. And even in their new law in 2010, that does not formally stipulate that brain death constitutes biological death. And a Lancet article reporting on that new law concluded that if the Japanese public became aware of the carelessness of many diagnoses of brain death in the USA, the change in the law could cause a lot of trouble in end-of-life care in Japan rather than less. And the total dose deceased donation rate in Japan is still very low at 0.6 per million population uh, compared with nearly 19 per million in the UK. So historical claims that brain death, as we've seen, represents a complete absence of any brain uh, function are patently false. And so too are claims that it entails permanent cessation of functioning of the organism as a whole, since brain dead bodies can continue physiologically functioning for quite some time on life support. Now, it is true that those diagnosed accurately as brain dead will never recover consciousness. But of course, the same is true of the vast majority of patients in persistent disorders of consciousness who breathe, spon breathe spontaneously. And in the light of these factors, Truog and Miller are surely correct in concluding, although it may be perfectly ethical to remove vital organs for transplantation, from patients who satisfy the diagnostic criteria of brain death, the reason it is ethical cannot be that we are convinced that they are really dead. Turning to circulatory death in relation to the uh, dead donor rule, this is usually defined in a way that requires cessation of circulation to be irreversible. But that definition doesn't stipulate whether irreversibility relates to auto-resuscitation or by CPR carried out by others. So some have suggested that permanence should be used as a substitute marker for irreversibility. And permanence would cover irreversibility of auto-resus, physiological irreversibility, and any decision not to perform CPR or legal irreversibility. But I'm inclined to agree with those who've suggested that making a distinction between permanence and irreversibility um, is um, what we would call just uh, smoke and mirrors or, or um, verbal uh, gerrymandering, because whatever it is we have to lose in order to be dead, we still have to lose it irreversibly and therefore we have to determine a point of death. And Den Hartog has suggested that this should be the point of death. Irreversible loss of the capacity for consciousness and irreversible loss of the capacity for spontaneous respiration. And he suggested a waiting time of five minutes uh, following the loss is sufficient to fulfill the dead donor rule. Now, whilst these attempts to redefine the criteria of brain and circulatory death in order to make sure all potential donors comply with the dead donor rule, there are others who are saying we should simply abandon it altogether. And those who do that generally argue their case on the grounds that the rule cannot meet the concerns of the organ transplant community. And that if respecting persons and killing them are assumed to be incompatible, then we'll compromise the utilitarian goal of optimizing organ availability 
Whereas those who support retaining the dead donor rule usually do so because they consider it to be a safety barrier protecting patients from being harmed by killing them for utilitarian goals. But as we've seen, um, Truog and uh, uh, Robinson, uh, who advocate uh, uh, abandoning the dead donor rule, they do so because they do not accept that the brain dead are truly dead. And they take the view that the concept of brain death has never been anything more than a social construction developed to meet the needs of the transplant enterprise. But even they would restrict organ retrieval um, uh, to those who are diagnosed as brain dead and would not permit it to those in a persistent vegetative state, for example. And in concluding, uh, I just want to uh, talk about those who, unlike Truog and Robinson, uh, would, in their desire to see as many organs harvested as possible, uh, have proposed various means from uh, taking uh, organs from the nearly dead. And this was from a, uh, this is a heading from uh, an article in a magazine fairly recently, um, suggesting that to honor donors, uh, we can uh, uh, harvest organs before and not after death. And uh, this final slide shows some of the um, situations in which that has been done, or it is suggested that it uh, should be done. And I haven't got time to uh, go through these, but would uh, just flag them up and say that organ donation, euthanasia, uh, and uh, both organ donation following euthanasia and uh, organ donation by euthanasia um, is a subject that probably is worth considering in its own right and certainly a, is expanding in Canada to a very worrying degree that I think may badly impact on uh, ethical uh, transplantation across the world if, if that takes off. And at this point, I think I should now come into land. So um, sorry, that was a bit rushed. And uh, sorry, I didn't have enough slides for you, Peter. No, that, that was fine. I just wondered whether I might have been missing something. But thank you. And, and thank you, you might. Very much. And, and, and it could have been very helpful. So that's great. Thank, thank you very much, Trevor. So uh, organs from the dead. Well, we've got a time of question and answer now. A uh, question here, uh, I'll start with an anonymous question, Trevor, um, which is thank you for your presentation, which was maybe more about questioning answers than answering questions. But you've raised a lot of, a lot of really important questions. Uh, in my own practice, post-transplant patients have more often died from the side effects of immunosuppressant drugs than from transplant failure. How much should the need for lifelong dependence on potentially harmful drugs be a separate consideration in the ethics of LO transplantation? Yeah, I I think that's a really really good uh, good point, and I, I'd like to sort of situate that comment within the the general framing. I think in which, I, and I can understand it sort of. The, the advertising for people to become donors is, is, is put out there tends to indicate that transplantation is a cure. Now, certainly from my experience as a general practitioner, um, it's much to be preferred for a person who is in end-stage renal failure to have a transplant and take the drugs than to go through dialysis, which is time consuming and uh, um, I think very difficult procedure for folks to uh, cope with, takes up a lot of their life. Um, but I, I think that comment raises the important point that, that it's not a cure that means that the patient will live a normal life if living a normal life and being well is not taking uh, medication. So, uh, uh, yeah, the, the, the drugs um, can sometimes be uh, uh, unpleasant. And the questioner obviously knows a lot more about that than I. Um, 
Thank you. Uh, Rod McRory from the UK, Trevor, is asking, should churches be doing more to promote members registering to carry a donor card? Uh, are we unknowingly increasing the risks of improper mm -hmm. processes of consent? And I know, uh, you know some Christians, particularly in the, in the wake of the Alder Hay scandal, were reluctant to sign up for, uh, for organ donation in the feeling that, uh, you know, for the fear that the, the boundaries might be moved and that organs might be taken when they weren't completely dead. Yeah, I think that's a really important question. The first thing to say is I certainly think that there is a place uh, for churches to be discussing these issues because they are really important for, uh, for church members. And it's extremely important that if we are medically qualified or um, uh, you know, engaged in medicine and know about these issues, that uh, as part of our ministry to churches, we should be encouraging talking about um, these things. Now, it depends on the, the system that's in operation in your country, uh, uh, of course, whether you're an opt-out or an opt-in. And, and now that we are... Um, uh, opt out, uh, it will be assumed that um, you have agreed to donate your organs. And I think the most crucial thing, whether we've signed up or uh, not, if we were under the previous system, is to talk to our nearest and dearest about whether in general we would like our um, organs to be taken after we have died. And in addition, to talk about our feelings about the amount of intervention that we might need or not need um, uh, in, in relation to um, states of unconsciousness, uh, being diagnosed as brain dead, and also if we do have a cardiac arrest, about how we feel about interventions that otherwise wouldn't be made and how the relatives feel about it. Uh, I think that is absolutely crucial, and we don't do half enough of that. Hmm. Just to pin you down, Shari Falkenheimer wants to pin you down slightly, uh, Trevor, uh, to yeah. say, as a Christian, what are your personal views on what criteria should be used to decide when it is ethical to remove donor organs? So you've described the range of views that there are in both extremes in the camp currently and we know there's a big debate going on what, what where do you land personally on this right i i i, I think that although i share some of the uh, concerns and the thing about thing about thing about bioethicists when i became a bioethicist um i i i kind of became more slippery i think than when i was a, a, a clinician uh but I, I do think that uh, a correctly diagnosed brain dead person um, is, is dead. So I accept brain death as a, a, as a criteria. So if I were diagnosed as um, brain dead, uh, then I would uh, uh, be happy for uh, my organs to be taken. But I have the advantage that, that that my son is a medical consultant and um, I would expect him to look into whether I I were truly brain dead. So I, I have some uh, reservations about the way the service is, is, is going at the moment. And, uh, uh, and of course, we do know that under pressure, um, doctors do um, cut corners um uh i mean having practiced for 30 years uh, uh you know uh, uh, i'm as guilty as any of, of that with regard to the post-mortem interventions after circulatory death there are concerns that you know if you start uh, reperfusing the body uh, that you might have taken an organ out and, and people recover consciousness um yeah i i, I I think that the, for me, the need for organs uh, exceeds that that very unlikely um, uh, scenario. So, so in general, I I am in favour. What what I should say is that I have discussed this with um, 
my, my relatives. But because at the time that we um, went uh, into the different system, I was concerned uh, and still am concerned about the way in which the state does some, sometimes make presumptions about um, uh, organ donation. And I, I do have Christian friends who are very concerned that the hunt for organs, you know, does sometimes influence judgment more than it should. So I am one of the two million or more who are currently opted out on the register, but on the grounds that whether I'm in it or off it, the hospital should ask my relatives what my wishes were, and they should carry the day. Um, I have hitherto been content that uh, it's okay that my relatives know that, but it's likely that I will withdraw my um, uh, uh, objection this year. So Thank you. you. Really and I think that, ask, that that answers another uh, another question that was probing more more deeply on on your own views on that. A, a comment here from uh, Timothy Hardcastle in South Africa saying, in South Africa, we recently made a national policy on death diagnosis and the process for ensuring that brain dead was brain dead. We face cultural opposition to donation, so we still struggle. And I know that's been a, a big debate point in the UK as well, that different cultural or religious or, or worldview groups will have varying degrees of reticence about this uh, whole process. So do, do you want, want to just comment on, on that at all and uh, what's been done to, to address that? Yes, I think my general comment would be that sensitivity and engagement is far better and I think uh, more godly than bludgeoning and browbeating. And one of the um, I, uh, one of the movies that really influenced me, and if you get an opportunity to see it, I think every person involved in transplantation should see the film Departures, which uh, was a Japanese film that won the best uh, foreign film um, Oscar, I think, in its year. And it's the story of a out of work musician who finds a job in a Japanese undertaker's. And the film shows the traditional um, Japanese ways of dealing with death and mourning. And the traditional belief is that the spirit does not leave the body until some time after death. Um, and if we want to avoid a repetition of you know, the PR disaster of that um, uh, Cynthia case in, in Singapore. I think we, we've got to be sensitive to those kind of things. Um, and also recognize that you know, religious belief is a very powerful uh, and, and should be a very powerful influence if the religion is true. But the principle applies to um, all faiths. And I don't think that it, uh, I am not an expert in Islam, but I did a debate last year with uh, an Islamic scholar who made it very clear in the debate that if xenotransplantation uh, does become possible and works, then in his particular um, uh, uh, category of uh, Islamic belief, then he wanted um, uh, that to become the default option because then the corpse could be uh, left intact. So there was a, a, a very real reticence there about uh, invasion of the body within that particular Islamic grouping. Um, uh, uh, Turkey has a very low deceased donation rate, and um, I suspect other Islamic countries is not something I've looked into in, in great detail, and I don't think it applies to all, all groupings. But I, I, I don't think you can uh, you know, enforce this on people, and the, uh, the sort of authoritarianism of uh, utilitarians in this regard is astonishing in some of the, uh, the, the, the writings. 
Just, uh, you've touched on xenotransplantation. Uh, there is a question here. Uh, uh, he says, I appreciate this question, again, anonymous. It's not immediately within the scope of your presentation, although related. Can I ask for your view on xenotransplantation as a way of circumventing some of the constraints around allotransplantation? For example, a pig heart into a human, in particular, the ethics of incorporating an animal organ rather than animal matter, uh, like, heart valves, for example, um, which don't have a circulatory component into a human body and the possibility of growing animals specifically for organ production. How does this differ essentially from the meat industry? Please feel free to decline to, to answer, but, but perhaps just a, a, a comment first on the state of play with xenotransplantation, you know, how close are we or, or do, do the uh, immune incompatibilities still make it only a distant, if ever, option? And then if it became possible, what would be your thoughts about it? Right, I, I think the first thing I would flag up is of course, um, uh, an earlier presentation that I've given in the series has been on uh, xenotransplantation. So if you're interested, I, I, I've gone into a, a, a bit more detail there. Um, when, uh, two years ago, when I started writing the book, I, in the chapter on xenotransplantation, made, made the statement that I didn't think it was likely to happen into a human for a considerable length of time. And then, of course, it happened the next year. So that had to be uh, adjusted when this pig uh, heart was transplanted. But I have real concerns about that, uh, that case. And, and there are several elements of it. It's not the time to go into all of those. I marvel that the ethics committee at that hospital approved of it. Um, and the fact that the patient died within two months, and although he died of heart failure, um, he certainly had had some uh, porcine uh, viruses that contributed towards his death transplanted over. I think this will make um, folks very hesitant about doing it again. Um, but it did uh, prove to be a sort of proof of principle experiment. And, 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 I, and I can only see it as an experiment. I mean, all, all pioneering things are, of course. It, what it did prove that in immediate hyper-rejection could indeed be overcome by the genetic manipulation that they'd done in the pig. So um, I think research on that uh, will continue. Uh, I have ethical reservations uh, about it um, in regard to humans because of the, the sort of gung-ho way that that happened, as I would see it, in the, in the state. But I also do have reservations about ethical elements of the um, treatment of the animals. There is a verse in Proverbs that um, indicates that um, God does take into account our uh, care or lack of care of uh, animals. And the, because of the sterile conditions in which uh, these pigs have to be raised and the fact that they have multiple blood tests and checks, they can't socialize and so on, I would see that as being... Uh, uh, more um, barbaric uh, than, than farming. So I think there are a variety of questions uh, about it, both from the human point of view and the animals. Um, but it, it may prove to be a, a, a way um, forward, but there are a lot of obstacles to be overcome. So I, I can't see that becoming routine with it within the next decade myself, but, but others on the, uh, the, the call may, may know more. There, there is a um, new book on xenotransplantation edited by Daniel Hurst, who's a, um, uh, an American expert coming out uh, next year that may offer uh, a lot more insight into this. And um, uh, yeah, I've probably said enough on that. Uh, thanks very much. And we'll certainly flag up your past uh, talks on, on webinars when we write to people after the series. Just on, on the continuing theme of viruses, you mentioned porcine viruses. Uh, 
and so on. But um, another very familiar virus, of course, is COVID. And you highlighted the fall of uh, all kinds of transplants, understandably, during the COVID pandemic. But um, Paul Johnson from Oxford, a pediatric surgeon, is asking, thanks for your interesting talk, Trevor. One of the other reasons that transplantation numbers reduced significantly during the height of COVID is that during the first and second waves, we were very cautious about starting our patients on immunosuppressants when we did not understand the disease and vaccination was just beginning. In the US, there are a number of specialized organ procurement centers uh, like St. Louis, where dead donors have flown interstate to a specialized facility for donors independent of the hospital, where there's no competition for ITU beds and donors undergo donor optimization, including coronary stenting prior to carefully planned organ retrieval match with theater available to minimize cold ischemia times, et cetera. What, what are your thoughts on, on that uh, development? That I, uh, that, I, that I was unaware of. Um, on the fly, that sounds to me to be um, uh, perfectly reasonable if, I, if I've understood it um, correctly. Um, uh, do come back on that, Paul, if, if you need to. Well, I, that's just jogged my memory about a, another um, uh, comment regarding uh, transmission of infection. There's been an interesting interchange in the Cambridge Quarterly of Healthcare Ethics just recently. There was a, an American article um, indicating that the risk of infection from xenotransplantation was so high that that person felt that uh, you know it, it, it shouldn't be done. But there's a counter article that's just come out saying that infection, as Paul has indicated, can be passed on even through allotransplantation as well. And a whole variety of disorders like infectious mononucleosis have been recorded as being transferred in that way. So um, that obviously, uh, it, it's not unique to xeno uh, transplantation, but I think the complications from, from COVID uh, were such that uh, I can well understand um, countries that have the, the wealth and the numbers of people in order to try and overcome uh, uh, the, those difficulties will will utilize that to uh, to the extent that they uh, uh, that they can. Hmm. A, thank you, Trevor. There's a comment here from Samuel Mark in the U.S. When someone's declared dead, we are to inform organ donation organizations immediately before signing the death certificate. Often this conflicts with our individual ethics, and and you've you've hinted there about the pressure that people feel under, especially with, with a, a hard opt-out um, to, you know, to comply when they might not feel personally comfortable about it. Just wonder, you, you mentioned also the concern about uh, what we might call pushing the envelope or uh, incremental extension, moving the boundaries with regard to harvesting organs from uh, children with or, or babies with anencephaly or uh, adults with various forms of PDOC like persistent vegetative state or minimally conscious state, severely brain damaged patients and so on. Do, do you think this is happening with any frequency and, and uh, what should Christian's reaction be to this? Should we have a, a voice in, in trying to shape policy on organ transplantation? Thanks. So just, want to slope, is what saying, really. just want to clarify re and carefully for, uh, for, first of all. Um, if, if the anencephalic infant has died, then clearly they, they are a deceased um, uh, donation. But there are um, certainly uh, articles out there saying that um, you know, e even if the infant um, is 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 born alive, then uh, because it won't in quotes have a life, its yeah. organs should should be taken. Now 
No, that's okay. what I was meaning. That's what I was meaning. Yeah, I, I recently right. participated in a conference where a pediatrician from Oxford, I think it was, um, said that he was caring for a, a, an anencephalic child who was 12 years old. Um, and I certainly have a slide from the internet of a child of four years old. And, and I think the general misconception is that they all die at birth. That is not the case. And therefore, uh, to have a blanket statement that um, you know, these children will not have a life at all simply isn't true in terms, terms of biological life. Um, but also, um, you know, the arguments about you know quality of life. You you can you can be a wealthy person with all your faculties and 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 you know wish that you didn't didn't have a life. Which which brings me to the uh, the subject of the the organ uh, donation from from euthanasia. I think that's the biggest threat of all at the moment in a world that seems to me to. Um, in Canada, Belgium, and the Netherlands, um, just have, I mean, it's not a slippery slope. Some a journalist described it as a black run the other day, and I thought, oh, that's, that's a really neat dis description. And the fact that secular papers are uh, journals, you know, and a wide variety of people, there was a there was a famous French atheist novelist coming out against his sister died the other day. That's a different topic. But wanting to get the organs from, from the nearly dead in that way, or those who want to be dead, um, I think that's going to cause real problems with transplantation in Canada very, very soon, if it isn't already. Yes, well, the, the, the so-called slippery slope. I, I'm afraid we're almost out of time and we have a lot more questions that we're not going to get to, sadly. But thank you, everybody, for all the excellent questions we've had. I, just before we close off, Trevor, I wanted to squeeze in one more. Coming back to the, uh, the, the biblical teaching on this issue. And of course, we know when the, the Bible was written, there wasn't such a thing as organ transplantation, but uh, God put timeless principles there. And, and you've alluded already to uh, Joseph giving instructions about how his bones were to be handled by his family after death. And what we see a lot of reference to that, of course, there's, there's Paul as well uh, with his eye condition uh, talking about uh, the Galatians taking their eyes out to give to them because uh, they loved him so much. And and I think um, Christians have often looked to scripture and said, you know, if if God uh, in, in Christ laid down his life for us, then then uh, giving our organs is, is a sort of sacrifice that we should uh, seriously consider as Christians. But do you want to just make any more comment on any biblical principles uh, really on the side of validating organ donation, why, why it's something that Christians should strongly consider. And, and you know, what the I, I think are. you've covered, covered quite a bit of it. And I think that the, the, the words of uh, Jesus that greater love um, have no one than they lay down their life. You know, that, that's a how much the more, isn't it, of, of just giving your organ rather than your, your life. Um, and, I, and I think the, the biblical... Um, elements of, of of respect for the uh, for the dead, how how we treat the dead, um, it is often a, a marker of uh, of how we treat the living. And I, I just happened to see that somebody had said, you know, how how can the dead be be hurt? And 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 the the dead can't be hurt, and they can't be harmed. And if I didn't make that clear in the talk, I just want to emphasize that. But the dead can be wronged in a variety of, uh, of ways. And I, I talk about several of, uh, uh, of these in, in, in the book. Um, and uh, just as you can be wronged by you know, relatives trying to uh, not do what you said in, in, in your will. Um, you know, sadly, one of the cases I, I had to report in the book was of a, um, a medical uh, a, a person who had, it was a hospital porter actually, who had access to mortuary, who sexually violated many bodies. And one can understand the distress and upset of the relatives. So 
people like John Harris who say dead bodies don't matter because they have no autonomy, they may just be you know, wanting to make a point and, and John very much knows how, how to make a point. But you have to accept that that is not all there is to it and dead bodies do matter to those who love the person whose um, corpse is being referred to. Yes, uh, thank you. I mean, that, that idea that they they cannot be hurt dead bodies, but they can be wronged. And, and as you've alluded several times, families can be both wronged and hurt if things are done wrong. And, and probably the whole idea of family and community and, and interconnectedness is, is such a strongly biblical uh, principle that Absolutely. runs against, runs against the, the principle of autonomy, which seems to be the only one that uh, <laughs> some people in our disjointed society seem to give any credence to. But uh, God sets us in family. You. That's the key verse. Yeah. God sets us in families. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Trevor. Um, apologies, folks, for running a bit over time today. Thank you for all your questions. So it just uh, remains to me to say uh, thanks again to Trevor. Thanks to all of you for coming today. We look forward to seeing you again soon on ICMDA webinars. May the Lord bless you. Thank you.